Hi, everybody. And let's talk now in week 11 about t-tests. So in last week's lecture, we talked about t-tests are just a very special instance of regression. And let's look at how that works out mathematically. So I just want to really highlight here that these are all the same uh, general linear model, least squares, right, math, math. It's just different scenarios we're applying it to. So for correlation, two continuous variables. For regression, two or more types of variables predicting a continuous outcome, right? And we looked at mediation and moderation. Now we have this scenario where we have a binary independent variable predicting a continuous outcome. And we've actually kind of looked at that already when we did our section on dummy coding. So let's now talk about traditional t-tests. So in an experiment, a simple experiment anyway, what we might do is have an IV that's binary. It has two options, right? And then we would have a DV, excuse me, that is either inter interval or ratio, or at least continuous. Because everything we're doing this semester is part of parametric statistics, or our dependent variables continuous. So let's say we've manipulated our independent variable. That means we have the control. This would make it an experiment rather than a survey or correlational design where one condition, um, sorry, one group got the experimental condition and one group is a control group. Okay, this is a very classic, simple experiment. Okay. That situation can be analyzed with a t-test, but honestly, any scenario where you have a binary predictor and a continuous outcome can be analyzed with a t-test, okay, which mathematically is equivalent to having a regression with that binary predictor. Okay, and so it's a simple regression model with one categorical IV and our continuous DV. <clears throat> so first thing, don't do what's called a median split. So don't take a continuous variable and make it categorical just so you can do a t-test. Okay, for a long time, people did this with ANOVAs, which is our lecture for next week, um, that no, don't do it. We've already taught you with regression how to analyze these variables. So treat them as continuous because the loss of the information when you do um, categorical splits can really mess up your, your um, null hypothesis testing. So we could, we would essentially lose information that can make us have the wrong decision, right? Type one or type two. Okay. And so people used to split variables into this sort of high and low or split them in the middle. And that's just totally unnecessary because we have the capability of analyzing them as continuous. So when you do a median split, what it's called, or split down the middle, you take a whole continuity and take it and just go whoop, and you know you lose all the information about that continuousness and you take two people who are right next to each other but are on different sides of the berlin wall so to speak and you force them to be more equal to the groups over here and that is silly don't do that instead analyze that with regression but if you truly have a variable that's binary we could do a t-test Often this median split scenario creates a smaller effect sizes. And most often I would say that you see type two errors. That's not always true. Sometimes you can get a type one error, but generally it reduces power. So a reminder, when you manipulate the levels or the groups in those IVs are two different things, you're doing an experiment. When you just measure them, like let's say you decide to do men and women or smokers and not smokers, whatever, then this is either quasi-experimental or correlational. Okay. And so naturally occurring categories sometimes are called quasi-experimental because I don't know why, they just are. <laughs> so there's two main things here. So we're really going, we're like coming back to the very first or second week's lectures and bringing up this idea of between subjects designs and repeated measures designs. So between subjects design, sometimes called an independent design, is where the groups, the two different groups are in our binary outcome, um, are totally separate. They never see what the other person does. Okay. 
And so we could, um, gosh, in that graph section, we had some people watching Bridget Jones, some people watching Memento. They never watched the other movie. Okay, they're independent from each other. A repeated message design, sometimes called within subjects or dependent designs because different fields can't get together and play long, are when we have a single group of people who see both of the conditions. Okay, so you'd watch both movies. Okay. So our t-tests correspond to these research designs because there's different considerations, different issues here we have to deal with. So an independent t-test is for between subjects or an independent design. A dependent t-test is for a repeated measures design. Because okay. in repeated measures, we have to deal with the fact that people are tested more than once. So we have to deal with what I like, I've always jokingly called the peopleness in the study because people start in different places, right? And if I measure them twice, I've now violated the assumption of independence where every data point is separate. Okay. And so the reason why we have to talk about these two things separately is because the data design, the design of the data collection rather, has violated one of our assumptions. So we mathematically have to unviolate it, so to speak, or control for it. So an independent t-test compares two means based on independent data. This is the between subject scenario. And when different participants are in each different condition or level in the study. A dependent t-test compares two means on related, paired, sometimes you'll see that word, data. And when the same participants took, took both parts of the study. That's what I'm going to do first here is walk through an independent t example and then we'll take a quick break and move to video number two where we'll walk through a dependent t-test example and summarize everything up. So we'll actually use the same example for both to show you how they differ, but you wouldn't normally um, run an independent t-test and a dependent t-test on the same data. Right, you would have to know. So the, the structure of the design of the data collection is something that you have to know about your data. Okay. This example from the field book is purposely made to show you how these mathematically are different. So are invisible people mischievous? Well, we put people big brother style in a community with hidden cameras. 12 of those participants got Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. 12 of those participants didn't. And then magically we measured some sort of outcome where we counted the number of mischievous acts. Okay. Textbook examples are fun. <laughs> okay. And so we have um, our data set in what's considered long format where I have a column for my IV, this is cloak or no cloak, and a column for my DV, mischievous. And this is why I said you just have to know what your data represents. Because when I have one column for my IV and one column for my DV, which is how R likes you to set up your columns for analysis, you just have to know that the groups are either between or within. So at this moment, we're going to treat this as a between subjects design and see what happens. Okay. Now let's think about what we're actually asking here. Okay. And so the null hypothesis in a t-test, and either one, usually is that the two groups are equal. Okay, their means are not different. They're drawn from the same population and they have the same means. Okay, so our no cloak group is equivalent to our quote, cloak group. Okay. Our alternative hypothesis is usually that they're, they are different. Okay, so we've got not different and different. Okay. Now we could do a one-tailed test where we said the cloak group is more mischievous than the no cloak group. But I will tell you that generally people treat these as two-tailed tests. Um, often people think of one-tailed tests as cheating um, because you, the assumption is that you, it wouldn't be significant. Otherwise, why would you do this? Um, as well as, uh, you know, if you do a one-tail test and it goes the other way, you've missed it. 
So first thing I did here was go back to that T apply thing we learned weeks ago. And I've printed out the mean standard deviation and sample size for each group just to see. So our cloak group has five and our no group cloak group has 3.75. And the question here is, is that statistically different? Okay. Just numerically, yes, those two numbers are different things, but is that different enough that we would consider those um, not equivalent, right? So right now we have the null, that those two things are basically equal. You know, given the, given the variability in the data, those are equal. Do, can I find enough evidence to reject the null and say those things are not equal? So let's see. So the rationale here is, right? What could have caused those differences? Well, it could be the variance in our manipulation, the cloak. This is our systematic variance, our good variance, our signal, okay? and our signal to noise ratio all semester. Okay? This is the signal, the thing that we know we manipulated. There's also variance due to just people being different, okay, which is our unsystematic variance or our noise. So we're gonna cr create that ratio of signal to noise. And so we've got our no cloak group and our cloak group and we're measuring their behavior. If those two samples come from roughly the same population, we would expect their means to be equal. Okay, so if there's nothing really going on with this cloak thing, then everybody acts approx <clears throat> approximately the same. And we would say this is all one big group of people. Now means can differ by chance alone. This happens. Sometimes you just collect weird samples and they're different, but we would expect a really large difference between our means to occur rather infrequently. Okay. And this is a type one error. When by chance, they, were, they appeared statistically different when they really aren't. Okay. So we'll compare the difference between sample means, take group one minus group two, and um, take that, that and compare it to the difference between means we would expect if there was no effect. So I'm gonna take my two groups, like five minus 3.75 okay. and compare that to a, a score um, that I would affect, I would expect if there were no differences between means. Okay. So what would I expect? Well, I, um, sorry, I thought that was down here. What would I expect if the null is true? There's no difference between means, it's in there. So zero. So I'm comparing the difference between my groups to zero. And that's why I said most t-tests are compared against zero. That's why when we did binary predictors in regression, our categorical groups, right? So we're basically asking if the slope is different from zero because the assumption is that you're using a null hypothesis test that says there are no group differences. Okay. That's our signal. Signal is the mean difference. The noise or the, depend or the denominator here is our standard error. Okay. Standard error, we've been using all semester. It represents the amount of variability in the uh, data. Okay. And so if the differences between samples we've collected is larger than what we would expect based on our standard error, we can assume two things. Okay. So if signal is larger than noise is what that whole huge sentence says. So if signal is larger than noise, two things could have happened. One, there's no actual difference in the means and we got it wrong just because we happen to sample two weird groups and that's type one. Or there are really differences in the means and that result reflects a genuine difference between samples. And so this is when we correctly reject the null and we've talked about this being power. Power is if the probability of doing this. Now, we don't always know which one is type one and which one's correct, right? We know when we make fake data, but um, we would hope that type one error happens very infrequently because we set the probability, our criterion low for that. 
And so as that mean gets bigger and bigger, as the mean difference between groups gets larger and larger, okay, we should be more confident that the means are actually different and the null should be rejected. Okay. And so if our null hypothesis is incorrect, we would gain confidence that our two sample means differ because of our experiment, null manipulation, or because these two groups are actually different. Now we haven't spent a lot of time looking at formulas this semester because computers make life wonderful, but I wanted to kind of show um, how everything we've done this semester is embedded in these formulas. Okay. So this is actually also the formula for slopes, right? We take group one minus group two. Okay. And this is another reason that folks often don't use um, us, um, one tail test is because you got to make sure you subtract them in the right order, which, you know, it seems like a simple thing, but we're, you know, remembering what the difference scores mean is, can be hard. That's what we talked about with B when we subtract like coded group minus not coded group. It can be very confusing. So just print out the means and look at them. Right? So it doesn't matter who we make group one and group two if we use a two tail test. Right? So I'm going to subtract them. I'm gonna divide by standard error. Well, from a million years ago, remember that standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, or in this scenario, standard deviation squared divided by n. There are two of them here, okay? And the reason that there are two of them is because I have two separate groups who have probably two separate standard deviations. Okay, so we're dealing with the fact that there's two groups here. You see n1 and n2. S pooled thing is a little weird. So this is called the pooled standard error. And the formula for pooled standard error is here on the slide as well. It's n minus one times the standard deviation for the first group. That's actually variance because it's squared. Okay. Plus n minus n two minus one times the variance for that group divided by n plus n minus two. Okay. And so this is a, ver this is a weighted average of the standard deviations. Okay. So we have our, our, well, it's variance, but we have our two standard deviations for each group. Right? And this is uh, essentially a weighted average of them. So if one group is much larger than the other group, we put more weight into that group because we have more data from them. Now, you don't ever have to use this formula. <laughs> We're going to make R do it. But the purpose of showing you this is I'm hoping to really like solidify. We talked a lot about degrees of freedom. This is the degrees of freedom. Okay. It's n minus one plus n minus one, which is the same thing as saying n plus n minus two. Okay. This here is standard error. Okay. So our signal to noise ratio has not changed. It is, what is the signal? What is the model? Well, in this scenario, the models of the mean differences. And so we take the literal mean difference minus the null, which is zero. Okay, so it drops out of the equation. There's an implicit minus the null difference out here. Okay. So that's our model, our signal to noise, which is standard error we've been using all semester. Okay. And this standard error accounts for the fact that there are two different groups. Okay. So let's see how this like ends up working out. Now, for data screening for these bad boys, you would check for accuracy. In missing data, you just exclude it because the only missing data point you can really have is a dependent variable and you can't make up the dependent variable here, so just don't do it. Okay, you make up a whole, a whole data point basically, um, which is not good in this scenario because there's only two columns. Outliers, so if you have an outlier, we only really have one continuous variable, so just use z-scores. Okay, you can't calculate Mahalanobis on one variable. So just use our z-scores here. Okay. Our assumptions, there's no additivity because there's only one variable. So we have linearity, normality, and now very specifically homogeneity. Okay. So why no homoscedasticity? Well, it's equivalent to homogeneity here. So we want equal variances in each group. 
Because if I think about my scatter plot, my residual scatter plot, I'd have group one and group two, and we want the spread to be the same for group one and group two, and that's the literal definition of homogeneity, where the spread is the same for each group. All right, so let's do that. Now, when I do, uh, I could just run this with LM, okay? and it would give me all the same answers. But the other way to do it is to use the t.test function in base R. We're going to write this like we're writing a linear model because that's what we're doing. So it's dependent variable. Y is predicted by our categorical variable. And if you don't put a categorical variable here, it's going to get mad at you. So you're going to know when you've done it the wrong way. So Y is predicted by X. Data set is our long format data. Now I am assuming equal variances here. And I think if we back up, oh, maybe quite a ways, where is our T apply? Oh gosh, really far. Okay. Now there are tests for equal variances and we could turn that function off, but I can, you know, they're roughly equal here. Okay. And so one, if one of them is like one, the other was like five, I might say, you know, I want to turn that off. Oh gosh, do, 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 There we go, okay. So leave this as true unless it tells you to turn it off. And then what it does is it corrects for how much, how different they are. Okay, what's called a sadder waste correction. And then here paired equals false. So that makes it an independent t-test. Okay. You'll see two sample t-tests at the top if you've done the right one. It gives you your t-value. Remember that the t-score is the ratio of signal to noise, that statistics is the love of standardizing things. And so that is the mean difference divided by the standard error. Okay. So signal to noise, so it's 1.71. Remember we talked a million years ago about generally it needs to be at least over two. We need to see a two to one odds, okay? One to one odds is not so good. Okay, I mean, it's 50-50, who knows? Gives you our degrees of freedom when we had 24 people, 12 in each group. So. N minus one, 11, plus N minus one, 11, gives me 22 degrees of freedom. Okay, because I have a mean for each group. It told me that I, the base option or the default option, excuse me, runny nose, um, <clears throat> is a two-sided test. So that's what it's running. You can tell it to do run a one-sided test, but we're gonna run two-sided tests. Okay, so the true difference in means is not equal to zero. It gives me that um 95 percent confidence interval on the mean difference so that's the 95 percent confidence interval on like 1.25 that includes zero so this is not significant just like our p-value here and it shows you your means again now one of the problem the general problem that you'll have with t-test is homogeneity especially with small sample sizes where our group variance is not equal, okay? So what we can do is very easily change var dot equal to false, okay? It'll say it's the Welch two sample t-test. This is actually the Welch Satterwaite approximation. And so what it does is it changes the degrees of freedom. So you lose power for the, the imbalance <clears throat> invariance, right? So the larger the imbalance and variance, the, the smaller your degrees of freedom, okay, which reduces power. Okay. So it, it's kind of a, um, a correction for maybe overweighting the variance in one group. Okay. And so if you have other issues like normality um, or linearity, it would be very weird to have a linearity issue here because it's only two groups. So you can only, only draw a straight line between two data points. Um, but normality, especially, you can use the Wilcoxon signed rank test, which is the non-parametric version. It does not assume the DV is continuous or normal. But again, we'll see this it's very similar. So our, our homogeneity is probably fine because the correction here is very small. Uh, tells me the same answer, right? Now, with especially with this very small sample size, this is a this is a small sample size. 
maybe I don't want to just think about p, p values and significance, but I also want to know like how big is this difference? Is this practically important with a you know a larger effect size, or is this a small effect and a small and not significant? And so some options, unfortunately, there are a bunch for independent T. There's Cohen's D for independent T, which should be listed as DS. There's Hedges G, which is a correction on DS. Glasses Delta, which assumes that one of them is a control group. We could actually calculate a correlation. I don't know, some people really like this. I don't think it's very helpful because correlations in uh, binary outcomes are hard to interpret, if you remember from our correlation chapter. Okay. And what we're going to do is show you how to do DS here. So we can do this in the moat library, and we're actually going to go back <laughs> to the early in the semester, like week four, and um, grab all of our numbers from our mean. We only have one variable, or, or one, um, yeah, one independent variable. So you know, there's mean one and mean two, okay. standard deviation one and two, and one and two. Okay. And the effect size here, actually, we would generally consider that close to large. It's a medium to large difference between the means. And so why is it a medium effect size and not significant? Okay. That's because you only got 24 people. You don't got enough power. You need more power, more people, more power. So let's talk about power. So how many people would I need? The other time we've looked at power, we've calculated this with the F2 um, for regression, but there is actually a specific t-test one that focuses on independent t. So we'll do power t.test. So n equals null, so leave that bad boy alone because that's what we want. How many people do I need for this study with this effect size? There is an assumption here that this effect size is representative. Put in my effect size. We're going to use 0.05 as alpha, our 80% power, a two sample independent t test, and a two tailed test. Now, I think I don't remember which type is the default. This is definitely a default, but just to make these very explicit. Now, we see this is the effect size we did. Now it says I need 33 people, but don't forget to read the giant note down here at the bottom that says that's the sample size for each group. So I had 12 people in each group. I actually need 33 people in each group. So it's like three times as many. Okay. So we'd need 66 people total, right? So why get a medium effect and a non-significant p-value? Power. Okay, so hopefully this like solidifies power. I don't have enough people to find this effect if I think this is an important effect. So we're gonna pause this here, take a quick commercial break, and then finish out this section by talking about dependency.